uh, and welcome to this evening's event called Yemen Beyond Mainstream Narratives in the Media. Uh, my name is Florian, I'm a journalist and editor at the Turban Times, uh, and I'll be the moderator of uh, tonight's uh, program. Since 2015, a bloody war has raged in Yemen. Thousands of civilians have lost their lives. Most death and destruction is caused by the Saudi-led coalition, which is not only bombing Yemen into submission, but also starving the country through a land, sea, and air blockade. As a direct result of the embargo, Yemen is currently suffering from famine and a cholera epidemic of biblical proportions. 80% of the country's children are in immediate need of help. Despite Yemen going through the worst humanitarian disaster in the world right now, international media coverage has been sparse, to say the least. Um, when the war occasionally receives its, its uh, due coverage, we are fed with the same simplistic narratives of a Shia versus Sunni conflict, of another rift in the Saudi-Iran rivalry. We rarely get any explanations beyond that political framework before our time is up. The reason for this will be among the topics of tonight's discussion. In his book, Destroying Yemen, author and lecturer Isa Bloomi suggests that we can only answer to the question, we can only offer answers to the question of why destroying Yemen by taking a broader perspective, one that, perhaps surprising to many, put Yemen at the heart of many global processes over the last century. For the next 40 minutes, Isa Bloomi will explain how to exactly understand the Yemeni war in a broader perspective. And in the end, we'll have a Q&A session for around 30 minutes. Um, we were supposed to have someone on from Sana'a right now. Has she answered? Okay. Can we put her on? Okay, great. So we'll have someone on live from the capital of uh, Yemen right now, from Sana'a. Her name is Siris Hadkwan. She's a Danish woman uh, who's been living in Yemen throughout this war. Um, she's the co-founder of the security company Safer Yemen, uh, which facilitates uh, security solutions for several international organizations operating inside the country. Uh, but I'll let her introduce herself in a moment. Um, what is left to say is that we at the Turban Times uh, hope that this, this event will uh, help put Yemen on the public agenda in Scandinavia for once. Um, maybe that's too ambitious, but uh, why not have dreams? So, also this event will be filmed and we will publish parts of it uh, on different platforms uh, along with uh, still pictures, just so you know that it might be in the frame. Um, so welcome everybody, and um, let me smell our water here. Tana, there's some water here. Okay. Um, good after or good evening. Thank you for braving the uh, fine weather, which generally dissuades Danes from uh, getting involved in anything serious and. Um, Obviously, this is a very serious topic, unfortunately, and very suggestively has remained off the main screen, mainstream media, not only here in Denmark, I assure you, but in much of the world as well. And we heard, I think, a very good synopsis of why this conflict is such a tragic one. Um, but I will extend it to not characterizing not only as a tragic one, but a criminal one. And unfortunately, those who are responsible for unleashing death, destruction, starvation, torture, psychological warfare will never see justice until at least they see their creator. And inshallah, they'll burn forever. Because this country uh, has um, a lot to say uh, for uh, what has happened over the course of the last hundred so years. Um, it is not a country that deserves to be associated with starving children, destroyed infrastructure, endless um, suffering, um, and it deserves to be um, put up in a pedestal as the emblem of the creativi creativity of humanity, of human beings, the possibility of so-called different peoples to interact and engage. Yemenis have been part of the larger world for millennia. Indeed, much of the 
cultural and political elites of Southeast Asia, South Asia, East Africa, throughout the Indian Ocean can claim some heritage to this amazing part of the world. And it deserves to be uh, remembered as, as such, um, as opposed to being a topic of conversation or discussion or debate um, in Denmark um, regarding the destruction of this country. I will present to you here um, in some 40 minutes an expedited attempt to lay down what I call the ground rules for a narrative which has been controlled in many ways by very powerful interests who obviously first and foremost don't want us to understand and think about Yemen. Um, and if we do, uh, we are expected to use terms quite often used rather flippantly in respect to the discussion of Islam and discussion of the Middle East and discussion of dark people around the world in general. Um, terminology that has often been used to obscure, redirect our focus, and ultimately silence. Um, both the actors on the ground, those who are directly impacted by these events, as well as those of us who are trying to bring some kind of empathetic engagement to the, to the events. So offering a discussion about why destroy Yemen, I first as both an uh, educator but as a fellow human being would like to do more, not so much advocating um, a, a, a way to put words into your mouth, but I would rather prefer that I take words out of your mouth. I want us to stop talking about conflict in Yemen in certain ways. Um, because references to the actors on the ground, as you heard, upwards of 20, 23 million people who live under the conditions of embargo, of daily um, air raids. We had at noon today the um, practicing the use of civilian air raid warnings or kind of public disaster warnings here in Denmark. Imagine if this was going on now for four, almost for more than three years um, on a daily day basis and actual bombs were dropping or the threat of bombs dropping on you, what impact that would have on, on your family, on yourself. To refer to them as simply rebels, delegitimizing their play, role to play has long been a strategy that extends much far further back in history than um, this, this conflict that, again, um, in the hands and in the words uh, used to discuss this conflict as a war of a coalition force, of an intervention to bring back a legitimate uh, government that was overthrown by rebels, by Shia, by Iranian proxies, is a kind of language that needs to be somehow taken out of our vocabulary. So ultimately what I'm trying to suggest is that the functions to obscure this conflict, the functions to complicate this, this, uh, this discussion or simplify this discussion are problematic and need to be addressed directly. And I can't do that um, with the time that I have, but just to give you this kind of pretext to how I'm approaching this. And I would suggest that fundamentally, what over the course of a hundred years I've been studying in my, in my research on this, this part of the world, it seems that we have now a campaign to effectively ruin Yemen. And I'll explain what ruin means as a definition. We call it it's the um, campaign to inflict or bring great irretrievable disaster upon uh, those who have until now demonstrated the capacity to at least lay down certain kinds of negotiable conditions for interested parties who actually are now investing in the destruction of this incredible country. It ultimately will lead, and I've suggested it's an active process. We can see that with the methods of engaging this conflict. Not only to obscure, to even hide from you the day-to-day -day realities that's going on for now over three years, but also make it impossible for us to talk about it in an empathetic way, dealing with human beings. No, we are dealing with rebels. We're dealing with proxies. We are dealing with collateral damage. And this is the kind of observation that is programmatically trying to ruin this society. And I'll try to bring some kind of historical context for us to understand why 
the targets since day one, indeed, that preceded this conflict, which started supposedly formally in March with the UN uh, Council giving a, a more or less an ultimatum to large numbers of people in Yemen that unless you subordinate yourselves politically, subordinate yourselves economically, there will be this campaign that we have. And this campaign has been targeting structurally, spiritually, emotionally, and historically the human assets of this quite remarkable part of the world. Ruin. The coalition, so-called coalition, um, we will debate, I will suggest in a more complicated terms, um, the association of this war with Saudi Arabia or, or personality is problematic. But nevertheless, the campaign, which is, circulates especially in um, Arabic media, um, takes on almost very familiar terms. If we recall George Bush's list of most wanted, it's kind of like a Hollywood Western film. The most wanted, if we can capture these people, we'll give you 20 million bucks if you help us find these people dead or alive. And it's not funny because it actually undermines the humanity of these people. So our uh, Saleh Samad, Samid, who was um, assassinated last week with a U.S. drone, it was not a Saudi plane, it was a U.S. drone with uh, some pilot in Tampa, Florida, who pushed the button, um, as, as we learned, was actually known for being someone politically pliable, somebody who was actively seeking to negotiate a way out of this conflict. Um, his assassination has led to a further, further entrenchment of those who have long advocated, let's just fight this out. Um, somewhat mischaracterization of the dynamics of going on the ground. There have been lots of cases of black backdoor diplomacy going on in Oman. It still goes on between the elders, if you will, of this society and representatives of the so-called Houthi movement in the north who are actually more accurately called a coalition under the umbrella of Ansar Allah, the party of God. Um, nevertheless, this one example, emblem, of an attempt to undermine our recognizing these actors as human beings with their very conflicted and often complex associations and um, motivations for resisting, fighting, projecting power, uh, retracting um, influence leads us to reducing people to easily targeted assets. This is um, what Operation Decisive Storm has been become most notorious for. And again, it's something that's actually, unfortunately, the Americans have long used as a strategy in, in, in South Yemen throughout the 1990s. And that's targeting large clusters of people. Where there may be one or two important assets on a wanted list, this happened to be a case of a funeral of a former Minister of Interior. So all the most prominent members of Yemeni society were in attendance at the funeral hall. And in October 2016, planes dropped first round of bombs. And as the Americans perfected at some point in time in southern Yemen in the 1990s, they did a double tap, which would means 10 minutes later, in the most cynical, purposefully destructive, murderous way, dropping incendiary bombs on those people who came to come and help save those who were injured from the first round of attacks. This is a, stra this is a thinking, a mindset to ruin people. It's not to win a war, it's to ruin a target, I am suggesting. We've heard how a mountainous country that it, is very difficult to navigate, even in the best of times, is being targeted so systematically that every single bridge that connects Yemen to the larger world has been targeted, destroyed. The capacity to eat, the capacity to feed, the capacity to care, the capacity to get out of harm's way has been significantly reduced. Cluster bombs are dropped over farmlands. Um, fishing fleets have been burnt um, to a crisp. Even the dairy farms and the cows and the animals that were feeding people and providing sustenance uh, have been targeted from day one. This is a campaign to ruin 
Yemenis to murder as many people as possible to, as we've suggested it with our previous speaker, to completely demoralize people, for them to basically give up. To give up what, though? Ruining the past is something that uh, they rushed to do even in the beginning uh, first months of, the, of, of this conflict. Attacking museums, uh, reminding us, well, I'm sorry, attacking museums like the one in Taiz, which had a manuf manuscript collection that dated back 1,500 years. The beginning of Islam and the historical uh, juridical heritage that belongs to all Muslims, indeed all of humanity, wiped out by a bomb. Why? They know where these targets are. It's the first targets they hit. It's to ruin the past. It's to ruin the association with Islam, with this people. It's to ruin our association with the rest of humanity, to delink Yemen from the rest of the world with time itself. But this is nothing new. This same ruling family who was propped up by the British in the, in the teens and then made, made and expanded into the 1920s and to actually conquer Mecca Medina in 1925 have been systematically destroying Islamic heritage. Look what they have done to Mecca. They've made it into a shopping mall. This is the same orientation that they have adapted to the rest of the world. Look what has been targeted in Iraq. Look what has been targeted in Syria and now in Yemen. So while Yemen has to deal with bunker-busting bombs that are most likely kind of semi-nuclear, who knows what kind of bombs they're using now, um, and dying of now, first generation of children born from this war are coming up with incredible deformities. I'm not going to show you pictures of this hor horrific genocidal uh, results of these things that are dropping, being dropped on Yemen. Um, unfortunately, the institutions that we have relied on in the past to give us some kind of moral guidance has proven to be completely corrupt. The UN just this week reported yet again that nearly 9,500 civilians have died in this conflict. That's the same number they used since the end of 2015. Ex explain to me why they cannot break, break a threshold of 10,000. Symbolically, morally, ethically, people maybe, maybe they've calculated, maybe they figure out once you reach a certain number, then people start getting upset. I don't know. Whitewashing this war takes place at all levels. Very large amounts of money have been spent to assure that we don't speak about this war in certain ways and assure that we speak about this war in other ways. So the one way we are expected to account for what's going on is that it's a simple conflict between ancient hatreds between Shia and Sunni. I can't get into the details of why even the reference to peoples of Yemen to be Shia in the 12 er sense of southern Iraq and Iran is both fallacious but also um, a nasty little um, kind of gameplay, wordplay. Let save it for uh, maybe question and answers. The most important thing is that the, the use of these kinds of terminology in Iran kind of use uh, uh, backdoor entry into influence in the Red Sea and this, the, the threats to strategic assets that are, uh, should be concerning for the rest of the world is um, a rhetorical ploy useful um, in other uh, conflicts as well, of course, but most Importantly, as done elsewhere, it effectively shuts out the, the voice of Yemenis themselves. And um, Yemenis have consistently, over the course of the 20th century, I'd suggest in my own work, but certainly in the last three years, demonstrated a collective defiance. Uh, there is not going to be a fold of these millions of people who are being subordinated, uh, who are being um, um, submitted with this, uh, this kind of violence on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is where it becomes very interesting for us and where I would like to introduce a new sets of terminology, if you will, to understand why this war was necessary in the first place and why it will end up um, in one, uh, one way or another. The war objectives that have been characterized and framed by think tank uh, jingoism and by mainstream media has made it impossible for us to actually appreciate what are the war objectives in the first place. 
that makes it very difficult for the, us to analyze, let alone find solutions to get out of this conflict. And indeed, in many ways, um, the, um, the de terminology itself has undermined the ability of uh, the, the primary agents for this war to figure out which solutions get out. So my, my task with my work has been to answer why destroy Yemen in the first place. And I, I insist that we have to actually go back further in time to then 2015, and even before the creation of a unified Yemen in 1990. And that entails looking at the Arabian Peninsula as a contested um, uh, region. In the turn of the century, at the end of the Ottoman Empire and the, um, the somewhat dis, um, uh, decline of the British influence over uh, much of, uh, of the European theater, the Arabian Peninsula, with, as these colors suggest, constituted a number of different competing polities. These are actual polities that at one point in time was recognized as a sovereign by some external powers over the, this period of 1904 uh, to 1923. You can see at the big purple in the, in the center is more or less what will ultimately be the founding areas of the um, Saudi dynasty. Uh, which would um, become, within the course of some um, 15 years of this first quarter of the century, the ascendant power with the help of a British, um, with the British uh, military and financial support. Now, it's, the context is that the Red Sea, after, especially after the, the construction of the Suez Canal, became of strategic importance to all the major global um, imperial interests of the late 19th century and Yemen was at the heart and center, and as it remains being the heart and center of the strategic concerns of all these parties. What that allowed for Yemen and Yemeni actors, uh, many who had very loose associations with each other, was offered them some leverage, and were able to negotiate the competing imperial interests to the extent that they were able to remain economically, culturally, and politically independent, or autonomous, if you will, from the larger structural transformations that were taking place over the course of the 20th century. Of course, as these larger interested parties invested considerable resources to gain access to Yemen's polity, um, its fundamental uh, ambitions, at least initially, was that Yemen itself was incredibly wealthy. It was a generator not only of cultural um, vibrancy, but also a generator of incredible uh, wealth enormous surplus of wealth that needed to be tapped into and could be redirected to service various interests. To its immediate north, as we can see with this map, the expanding Saudi dynasty, a particular faction of the Saudi family, uh, territorially expands to the north at the expense of the Rashidi dynasty, uh, expands to the west, uh, ultimately capturing the Hashemite regions of the Hijaz, Mecca, Medina, ultimately, and to the southwest, conquering areas that are culturally, historically Yemeni. This is the areas of the green, we call the Asir. Asir. Um, the Ibn Saud dynasty from 1923 onwards, uh, f serving uh, in partnership with the expansionist British who were concerned with preserving their um, spheres of influence in Mesopotamia and along the Gulf, um, saw f to uh, the Saudis being the kind of ascendant power. And it plays itself out in very important ways along the frontiers of what would become Saudi Arabia and North Yemen from the um, 1930s onwards. These contested areas that, as I ref referred to before, the Hijaz that was once a Hashemite uh, sphere of influence, a territory for the Idrisi, which is a dynasty that lasted until the 1930s, and what today constitutes North Yemen, Northwest Yemen. Um, we'll leave that aside. So returning again, look, considering this, the Yemen's various polities that it can constitute in this southern part, and this multiplicity of colors, are actively engaged in negotiating empire or in um, competing imperialist projects throughout the interwar period and into the post-World War II period. And in many ways, this is the kind of similar dynamic that we need to keep, into, uh, keep in mind as we talk about Yemen today. 
So I would suggest that there are forgotten heroes that certainly Yemenis haven't forgotten, and they will certainly celebrate them with um, a constant reference to them, especially the man to the left. I'll introduce him in a second. A man that most likely Ali Abdullah Saleh's hand was involved in his assassination, if not directly, then indirectly, he was a beneficiary of this guy Hamdi's uh, removal from power in 1977. Um, and to the man to the right is one of the imams um, um, that's who ruled Yemen, North Yemen, until 1962. What we forget is that North Yemen was, despite the fact it being a so-called kingdom, as the terminology, again, we want to take the terminology out that we use to talk about this region, the so-called kingdom or medieval um, imamates that um, uh, Westerners have long used to, do, um, or to describe the polity of North Yemen was on the forefront of the progressive resistance to expanding caste capitalist interest in the Middle East. It's the imamate of North Yemen throughout the late 40s that resisted the creation of Israel. They were the first ones to articulate the, uh, the, the, confront, the confrontation at the UN, in fact, against the creation of Israel. They were actively involved in um, forming a military and then ultimately a political and economic alliance with fellow Arab states. Uh, we, don't, we, we, fair, we rarely remember that it was North Yemen that was part of the partnership that was created between Iraq, Syria, and Egypt that would ultimately become the United Arab Republic of 1958. Uh, and as you can see various pictures of these imams with Nasser Ali Abdul, uh, and, um, and the, the ruler of Syria at the point of, okay. Um, unfortunately, the Cold War takes its kind of um, predictable turn in Yemen. It, it becomes useful to see Yemen in these terms, and it's often characterized as an extension of the Arab Cold War. Uh, certainly a Cold War between uh, Saudi um, conservative uh, religious uh, theocracies versus the progressive secular states of the United Arab Republic, or um, um, Nasser's Egypt, that is sometimes framed. Um, in the 1970s, we see the rise after the end of the uh, imamate and the, um, the establishment of a, re a loose republic, if you will, in North Yemen. We see the rise of an interesting character named Ibrahim al Hamdi, who we see here has, has uh, in a picture with the founder of Abu Dhabi's um, kind of emirate that became a key member of the United Arab Emirates. And his nemesis, Abdullah Hussein al ahmar whose family would play a central role in subsequent generations, especially forming the foundation, the kind of theological foundation to um, the Islah party, which has long played an important role in the 2000s in Yemen. Uh, more pictures to just depict the new player since 1978 who became an important actor to bringing Yemen yet again into the, um, the uh, forefront of geostrategic uh, um, campaign, especially uh, opening up a window of opportunity for um, my um, personal um, uh, enemy number one, the United States of America. Uh, unfortunately for Yemen, it benefits from or it is cursed by its wealth. Um, geologists have known that Yemen has been connected to the larger Indi uh, Indian Ocean um, geologically, um, and these three major um, uh, fields of oil that extend from inner Yemen, underwater of the Red Sea, out into Somalia, basically links throughout the 1990s and 2000s, the tragedy of the Horn of Africa and Yemen. Um, and unfortunately, it becomes a, a useful um, a connecting point to see it in terms of the oil industrial complex. Uh, our good friend, uh, uh, George Bush Sr., who was at this time vice president under the Reagan administration, an oil man to the core and former head of the CIA, actually paid a visit to uh, North Yemen in 1986 and carved out a deal uh, to secure for his Hunt oil buddies from Oklahoma a, a, an exclusive, exclusive access to Yemen's oil wealth, which happened to be at that time still in southern Yemen. And we begin to see, very interesting enough, not by coincidence, a movement towards unification that actually had, um, uh, had meat behind it, if you will. 
and for some strange reason, heavy investment in Yemen's oil industry at this time when oil prices were at $10 a barrel. Why were they investing a billion dollars on pipelines and drills and ports when oil was basically coming out of the ground for free? Um, the legacy of British-Saudi alliance, as I mentioned before, was an extension, it was, it resulted in an expansionary Saudi state that ended more or less at the frontiers of what we call today the border between Saudi Arabia and Yemen. But that has long been an open border. And it's only with the help of Ali Abdullah Saleh, who was able uh, at some point to subordinate southern um, elites and uh, much of uh, North Yemen's political uh, community, to actually come to a, a, an agreement to finally um, delineate a boundary between Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Most Yemeni nationals will make reference to that Asir region that I mentioned before as still occupied Yemeni territory. And this will have, I think, consequences over the long term in the next decades or so. Um, I don't think it's a resolved issue at all. But Saudi Arabia, with its partnerships first with the British and the Americans, has been an expansionist um, juggernaut in the East as well. And there are territorial conflicts between Abu Dhabi and Saudi Arabia, as well as Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. And these may actually come to the fore again. And indeed, I would suggest the conflict in Yemen as it explodes in from the 1990s onwards, involving these people of Northwest Yemen that we refer to simplistically as Houthis, um, is a byproduct of this very contentious process of solidifying boundaries. This is at a time when Europe is, was supposedly ripping apart boundaries and border posts. Uh, we have nevertheless advocates for securing and consolidating boundaries elsewhere. It's a very lucrative business to securitize boundaries. And this had a direct impact on how Yemenis on both sides of the border lived their lives. And the result is that with the imposition of this border in 2000, the militarization of this border, the murdering of people who, who traditionally would come across these borders to feed their animals or to water their, their animals, uh, would have long-term consequences for Yemen's stability. And again, it's a, it's a process, it's a context that actually explains and accounts for why in the northwest part of Yemen, these affected peasants, largely rural population who are directly affected by the, the economic closure of what was their main economic resource, cross-border trade, uh, resulted in the instability, destabilization of these communities, who started the making um, direct demands on the Yemeni state and on Saudi Arabia, that ultimately uh, the response was conflict was violence. The origins of the so-called Houthis is a collective kind of rejection to this um, state of affairs after 2000. The result was, as we heard from our previous guests, nine years of war. Uh, Saudi Arabia and, and Ali Abdullah Saleh had formed some kind of coalition to subordinate this northwest population. They started to evoke the terminology of Shia Sunni at this time and unleashed the um, politics of takfirism uh, in its ugliest forms at this time as well. Uh, conflicts don't get resolved so easily. Uh, people's lives are directly affected. The fact that large numbers of Yemenis who often had traditionally worked seasonally or for long periods of time in the Gulf as, as guest workers, as military employees, as construction workers, the fact that that access to income had been shut off, the fact that uh, this has now been for nine years a war zone, left hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people uprooted. That's a very dangerous combination for, for a population that is lead, basically eating hand to mouth on a daily day basis. And so when you have people, like Bob Marley said, a hungry man is an angry man, we had millions and millions of angry men and women. And they were easily, or maybe not so easily, um, mobilized by people who actually started to represent and speak on their behalf. It's been characterized today as simplistically as, again, Houthis, as an Iranian intervention into these local affairs. It has actually much deeper roots, and it actually has a much more logical accounting for it. But you have to take Yemenis into account, not just use this jingoism of, of the outside world. Ultimately, leading to the so-called Arab Spring, as was mentioned by a previous guest, 
these people who are associated now with the Houthis were fundamentally responsible for taking, bringing people to the streets in the first place. And in many ways, they were responsible for maintaining some kind of law and order. And probably won their right and deserved their right to be participants in any post Ali Abdullah Saleh regime uh, transitional phase. But it is exactly these people who come from this northwest part of Yemen who were shut out by this imposition by the outside world for this interim government under the name of this man Hadi, which has been referred to before. So the coalition of peoples who have, again, very loose, uh, if not any, uh, associations directly with this political um, operative around the, Houth the personality of Houthi uh, form this coalition of Ansar Allah. It's a grand um, coalition, if you will, that it extends not only um, by the mid-2014s, mid not only North Yemen, but increasingly also South Yemen. People have become aware that this is just was a ploy or this was a scheme. This is a completely corrupted um, process in which Hadi takes the legitimacy of the state and starts to, a process of, um, I can elaborate maybe a little bit more for you with Q&A, basically the um, taking away Yemeni's uh, sovereign assets and selling it off to the lowest bidder, it happened to be Qatar and Saudi Arabia. The biggest, probably the deal breaker that, again, had left large numbers of people out of the process that was supposedly to be negotiated to rewrite a constitution, to have elections that were all, was constantly being delayed and, and undermined because, again, as we heard from our previous guests, Saudi Arabia and certain other external actors actually do not want to see a viable functioning uh, state in Yemen. It actually serves their interest to, and I'll explain why in a second, why an unstable, chaotic Yemen um, actually becomes a strategic, um, a strategic interest to certain parties. The so-called National Dialogue Conference, which again left out the people we associate today with Houthis, which again was a broad coalition of people from the Northwest. It left out those who were advocates for separation of the South, the Hirak movement. The fact that this was not a representative kind of dialogue process in the first place, and the fact that suddenly behind closed doors, somewhat in stealth and secret, they throw on the table last minute this federation scheme uh, in which much of the uh, oil and gas and, and uh, offshore wealth would be se sequestered to the largest territory to the far right with the lowest number of people actually living in it constituted a, a remarkable breach of trust um, and a very dishonest attempt to steal much of Yemen's oil and, and gas resources um, right underneath the nose of the vast majority of the Yemenis who find themselves broken up into four different very incoherent territories in the far northwest. So it's this kind of classic um, um, think tank kind of interventions with UN agencies providing the kind of textbook solutions to conflicts that begins to become a very a generative, it generates a new kind of vocabulary where the only solutions that we have is to be and introduce what sounds on paper, looks sounds great, right? Bringing regional autonomy, but look at the boundaries themselves, look at the consequences. If indeed the Federation of Yemen takes its form in this, in this way, what happens to the people who live in this country? Uh, much of the wealth ends up in the hands of two or three um, important families and it gets sequestered out without any direct um, benefit for the vast, vast majority of these people. And this is where, once again, people said enough is enough. And they took to the streets, they combated the so-called legitimate government of Hadi and the rebels with vast support of people um, on the ground removed this um, puppet from power. The, inter the problem is that this resulted in an immediate reaction from the external forces who had long hoped to benefit from this intervention in Yemen, mobilizing the kind of language would make it easy for us to understand why they had to maintain this kind of external oversight over Yemen's future. And that again is the oil resources and the gas resources that I've mentioned before. If you then tailor the actual drawing 
uh, the actual drawing of these uh, federated zones, and you can see where all the oil and gas resources are, again, as I mentioned before, the vast majority of Yemenis would not benefit from the exploitation of what was a unified Yemen would had uh, in, um, considerable oil and gas wealth. So um, as the uh, uh, negotiator that was appointed by the UN initially and who was ultimately fired by the UN under pressure from the Americans, the Barack Obama administration and Saudis, he actually mentioned that we were on the, literally on the ground of coming to a negotiated end to this conflict where there would be elections, where there would be a parliament that would be brought together to draw up a constitution. And it was at that point when there was actually light at the end of the tunnel where the intervention took place in March 2015. So why, if I can, do I, if I have some time to briefly explain why this needs to take place. First of all, uh, the interested parties, the ones who have invested in violence on Yemen are bankrupt. Saudi Arabia is not that kind of um, heaven of, on earth where there's all kinds of money flowing from, from, from the trees. It's actually a bankrupt regime that has been desperately squeezing assets from its own population, cheating many of the businesses who have long um, thrived and working with, 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 within the so-called kingdom, and aggressively seeking out external assets. It can't borrow money anymore without paying considerable um, interest on that money. It's, it's borrowing money to pass, pay past debts. And it can't even sell its assets anymore. Its oil company is not attractive to global markets. It needs ex extra assets. It needs extra, um, uh, say, uh, collateral. And the idea was that perhaps with these huge oil reserves of, of Hadramaut, which is just on the other side of the Saudi border, maybe that would be an added attraction to Aramco. Then they can privatize Aramco, issue an IPO, and make what they were hoping to make a trillion dollars, according to some estimates, which is all fantasy, of course. But this, in many ways, can account for some of the strategic um, investments in the ruin of Yemen. Uh, unfortunately for them, the war did not end quickly. It became a quagmire, and much like imperial over. over overstep um, elsewhere throughout history, it becomes uh, actually quite clear then where the divisions in the so-called coalition actually existed all the time. So it is not a coalition. It is actually a, a fragmented, as we heard from our previous guest, actually a war within a war itself that's taking, taking place mostly in these areas where all the assets are in the far, uh, in, the, 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 uh, in these areas that used to be southern Yemen. And it, it pits the UAE. Uh, Qatar is now out of the picture since April of 2000 uh, of last year. An extension of this point that I'm trying to make, and it pits the UAE against assets that the Saudi American military-industrial complex have invested in. But to emphasize the point: the investment uh, is very different between the so-called coalition partners who are actually at war with each other in South Yemen, at the expense of, of course, ever finding a long-term solution for this conflict. For Saudi Arabia and its assets, it's mostly foreign mercenaries. Uh, UAE has also hired considerable numbers of mercenaries from Colombia, and they've used Eric Prince's various companies to provide manpower. But what's so interestingly different about how the other side of this internal conflict in, in Yemen um, has invested heavily in the Sudanese soldiers, hundreds of whom, maybe thousands, have died. They're apparently now, as of yesterday or two days ago, shooting each other because they haven't been paid in a long time. And um, as we can see, even Americans um, have been killed in the battlefields, serving as mercenaries, these, uh, these projects. Um, uh, there's been a shipment of Chad, soldiers from Chad, some 1,500, uh, but again, the idea of plundering African assets and finding fodder, cannon fodder from elsewhere in the world, there's a limit to this. And as we heard, uh, Yemenis, who are very resilient people, have quite brilliant engineers. They've had, they had the strongest military in, in the region before this conflict. They had ballistic missiles before. They're modifying their missiles. They're, they actually have factories under, underground, and they're firing ballistic missiles now at Saudi assets, Aramco uh, refineries. 
We don't hear much about it, but believe me, these missiles are sometimes hitting their, their targets. Again, the prize is Yemen's economic, re it's, it's, its resources. Not only is it, mine, is it, is it gold, I'm sorry, uh, oil and gas, it's mines, it's gold mines, it's all these other kinds of industrial minerals that are highly coveted. And then it's fisheries. Um, the, U, the World Bank made a report that I discovered in the kind of brushing off cobwebs that they, dis, they, they were alerting the world that they need to invest in developing its fisheries. It's the least efficient, only f some 14% of its uh, capacity were ever exploited. And it's probably the richest w single area in the world today left to exploit its fishing uh, resources. If you consider how much uh, the developed world likes their sushi, for instance, and I'm, and I'm, I'm not being facetious here, it's actually quite true, they spend literally hundreds of thousands of dollars for fish, for one fish. Uh, you can see why some Spanish companies or Thai companies or Chinese companies are loving the fact that there's war now in Yemen. They're just plundering Yemen's fisheries at the moment. Um, again, this has consequences for the, the, whole, the whole cohesion of the economic superstructure, I'm sorry, the political structure of the Middle East today. The, the seemingly on the surface as we talk about it, Allies, um, members of the GCC, has clearly fragmented. It's become more public in respect to the Qatar and its neighbors, but it's also much more prevalent and obvious on the ground in Yemen that um, as the Saudis are plundering its last of its resources, arresting members of, its, of the extended family, uh, torturing bin Talal to release his bank accounts. He just yesterday and two days ago reportedly was selling a third of his, another hotel of his for $500 million. Um, even the prime minister of Saudi, uh, of Lebanon was arrested and kidnapped and, and basically was forced under, under duress, duress to release whatever his father had accumulated. Perhaps we'll never know the, the realities. On the other side, the UAE, which has, for very different reasons, which I can explain on Q of A since we've run out of time, have actually um, invested not only in hiring mercenaries, but also their own children's blood and flesh. And it's becoming an increasingly, um, um, let's say, all too familiar story in the UAE from where I just returned. These stories of her heroism, the leader comes and kisses the head of a, of, a, of, a, of a brave soldier who lost both legs. Families who are put on TV to celebrate that they, you know, their son has made an ultimate sacrifice for the nation. The idea of a UAE finally united in ways they didn't have before, the war certainly is doing that. But it's, it's, it's creating kind of interesting tensions that we rarely aren't are allowed to talk about nor observe. But it seems that um, even the UAE, which has invested even its own children into this conflict, um, are suffering the consequences of a war that has not been finished, that the campaign to ruin Yemen continues, but it may, in all ironies, actually ultimately result in the destruction of those who are trying to destroy Yemen today. So I end with that uh, observation, and hopefully we'll have a little time for, for me to elaborate if there's interest. Or you didn't mention that at all, and I, I 
for me, it's really interesting. So now we've heard so much about the Saudis. So what is the Iranian, the Iranian intention in this world? Thank you for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. And my question is about the morality of the West that embarrassed the coalition and sending money to their Saudi Arabia so they can continue this criminal act. What's the moral ground of the Western countries and what's the responsibility of the Western citizens? to really defy this kind of so-called being human rights, purely human rights or anything. That's my question. Um, answering that question and the one that's in between will ultimately answer uh, an impossible question to answer in the first place. Uh, what is the role of citizens, as in any kind of um, issue that confronts a citizenry. They can they pick and choose, I guess, their fights. And again, it's pretty tough in this part of the world to uh, make people think beyond maybe a couple of minutes, uh, maybe to give once in a while um, to a cause that has come to your attention because with the, sun's, with the sun out and there's lots of Carlsberg beer and there's the football and then, you know, there's the girl stories on, on uh, Cosmopolitan. And I'm being cynical and maybe, maybe too much, but it's also a reflection of a reality that it's very hard to mobilize people to get and give a shit about these kinds of things. It's not um, in our um, mindset anymore to mobilize Yes, mobilize for one day to show up for a, a kind of collective show of solidarity. 50 people with a couple of placards stop the bombing. But then we go off and celebrate our collaboration um, and very quickly forget. It's hard because we don't experience the day-to-day -day, um, uh, pressures of survival in those terms. And as I tell students all the time, that we, our lives here, our comforts are being subsidized by the suffering of the vast majority of other deaf people in this world. And unless we're willing to actually sacrifice something, sincerely sacrifice our way of life and actually you know, pursue an active campaign to change how wealth is distributed in this world and how we actually account for it, taking words out as much as putting words in, how we talk about the world, uh, unfortunately, there's not much I can expect uh, we as citizens can do here. Um, there's a larger critique about the way politics works in the Western world, so-called Western world, and especially in Europe. Um, which I, I'm new to Denmark, and maybe Denmark is different, but I, I suspect just by my short period of time here that um, just getting people to sit down and listen to something um, is, is a trial in itself. Even if they're trying to get a degree and need, are actually expected to come to class, and rarely do we get the whole class coming. So um, this is not uh, an easy task. Um, and again, if you recall, my initial intervention was trying to get words, take words out of our way of understanding these conflicts. The reference to Iran to me is emblematic of that. Um, it is, I think, an inserted dynamic to this conflict that, again, has much deeper roots and has nothing to do with Iran at the fundamental structural level. Rhetorically, now, it does have significance. It's being used as a way to, one, explaining why the war is necessary and explaining and accounting for why Yemenis are doing certain things without actually asking Yemenis themselves. Um, I will uh, respond to that question by saying Iran has nothing to do with this at a practical level, uh, on the ground. If you're suggesting that they are military support, that's nonsense. Um, Yemenis are, um, are doing this on their own. If you're suggesting that there's diplomatic support, where? Where's the beef, as they said in the United States in the 1980s? There is no diplomatic support. They're not even spending much time 
other than maybe a occasional on press TV, a reference to the war in Yemen. And again, military support, give these brothers and sisters some stinger missiles like the Americans gave the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, then you'll see a change in the war. But that's, of course, not going to happen either. So the answer to the second question, that don't, bring Yemen, don't bring Iran into it. it. It does not help at all us understanding what's going on in reality, because the people who are ultimately will determine the length of this conflict we can characterize them as Houthis. I suggest that's actually a mischaracterization of the vast coalition of people who are being, both being targeted for ruin, right? I mean, they're all identified as Houthis, perhaps, in some ways we frame it, but they certainly have very different reasons for why uh, they are still in North Yemen. And to, um, to uh, suggest that the only way we're going to resolve this conflict is to see one side capitulate is pretty tragic. Um, there is it's very interesting, before he was assassinated last week, he actually gave a very, uh, uh, Sadid gave a very interesting interview to a woman you can find on internet. That's something for civilians, citizens to do. Actually spend more time looking things up. Don't go to Al Jazeera, because Qatar has its own objectives. Don't go to Sky News Arabia, or go to Al Arabia, for goodness sake. Go there, but don't use that as your exclusive source. Allow, allow for a spectrum of perspectives to actually influence on how you interpret things. Um, that's one responsible thing we as citizens can do. Uh, the duration of this war, my own suspicion is that the coalition is fragmenting, so-called coalition. Uh, the moment one of these contractors don't get money. We see what's happened with Sudanese soldiers. They're, they're fighting now their defenders. There's a big problem with many of the so-called mercenary troops. They're leaving the front line. I mean, this is a big problem. There's the interesting economy of war that it, since time immemorial is the people who are involved and invested in, in, in the war are invested sometimes for, for self-interest. Now, Sudan as a national issue is saying, we got to bring these guys back home. Now, where are they going to get the troops? That's one side. That's the logistical ground issue. You, the moment you start f figuring out that the Saudis don't have money anymore to fund the contractors, that they're borrowing money at 6, 7, 8 percent, then there's going to be an interesting question about how much longer can Suleiman, uh, sorry, Mohammed bin Salman uh, go and with an extended hand encourage the financiers of, of the Western world to come and back up this campaign. Because it's not only Saudi Arabia that it's a project, long-term project, it's the UAE's long-term project that is at stake. And at, at this stage, it seems the UAE, which has cultural links to Yemen in ways that, Saudi Arabia, that the ruling family of Saudi Arabia does not, um, means that uh, UAE is there for the long term and actually has demonstrated its ability to stand and establish um, and actually integrate into many of the communities of South Yemen. And this probably explains why they're in direct confrontation with Daesh and Al-Qaeda, by the way, who are, of course, getting extended support in, um, by external actors. So it's, I'm not going to predict, but my suggestion is that we look closely at the third and fourth pages of Financial Times, these little blurbs that talk about, oh, the Saudi Arabia has delayed yet one more time the issuance of an IPO for Aramco. It's because they're not going to get what they want. And the longer they wait, the less chance they have of actually trying to find the finance to actually tilt the balance, if you will. And the moment one of these mercenary companies do not get paid the first time, you're going to see uh, much worse reactions than with the Sudanese troops on the ground in some horrible corner of, of Tihama on the coast um, will get. Yes, uh, first of all, thank you very much for a very horrifying but also compelling talk. Um, it seems to me that you don't have a very high impression of uh, US foreign policy ambitions to begin with, but I was wondering if you could say something about how and if the situation for Yemen has become any worse since the beginning of the Trump administration. 
I mean, Trump and all of his cronies are very cozy with Eric Prince, um, who would seem to be supplying some manpower, but also very much with Mohammed bin Salman in, um, in Saudi Arabia. Um, the arrival of Trump did change dramatically things on the ground. Um, the Obama, Bush, and Clinton um, eras were closely connected with Qatar. And in many ways, what Trump did with his little uh, globe um, act when he went in, uh, to, to Saudi Arabia and brought all these parties together and said, look, you're going to have to start paying uh, your way. That's what my impression, at least. And we saw dramatically happen. What happened afterwards is the breaking off of the Qatar, the isolation of Qatar, uh, the, the gestures periodically that you know, we can easily just take over Qatari territories, which means the world's biggest gas field. Um, didn't happen because Turkey, in particular, intervened. Uh, but Iran, ironically enough, also gestured that because they share an, a gas field with Qatar. Um, they will not repeat what they did in Bahrain in 2011, 2012, uh, which is interesting enough. The uh, uh, Arab Prince phenomena, they actually have very convoluted relations with UAE as well. And it recalled that Donald Trump and his very idiosyncratic uh, base of support in the United States, which is largely white, um, middle class men who have been very frustrated by the economic transformations of. United States since 2008, who see no hope anymore in their society. There's no more middle class dream in America. And they, they, one element of that American society is taking that kind of visceral right wing rhetoric that we see in Europe also on the rise. Um, and it's not necessarily one that um, uh, falls into place with what was happening preceding that administration. There was a new investment in events on the ground in Yemen, the use of special forces again for the first time in many, many years. And it was actually used against assets of Saudi Arabia. Um, what has happened in subsequent years or months with the Trump administration, with Russiagate and with all these things that have clearly put pressure on the individual, um, he's shed Bannon and these other kind of ideologues who actually were trying to push the Republican base away from the neoconservatives, away from this kind of privileged uh, Republican party that had more in common with the Clintonites, the centrist, if you will, than his kind of natural political base. So American politics is playing itself out in interesting ways in strategies regarding parts of the world. He may one day iterate that America is leaving Syria, for instance, right? We're not going to occupy Eastern Syria anymore. And then the next day, um, he retracts. He made similar gestures during the elections about how evil Saudi Arabia is and that he's done business with people who are directly affected by uh, oil finance. We need to keep that in mind, that he actually has golf courses in the UAE. He has old business alliances with those people who are directly in conflict with Qatar and Saudi Arabia. Whether or not that translates into his ability to do anything, do presidents actually have capacity to change so dramatically the direction of American empire? I, clearly, I have my doubts. Uh, and his administration, the very early stages, I think, in interesting ways, um, revealed for a moment the kinds of powers that interested parties that are often not on the surface uh, available to us as outside observers. And it's an ugly, ugly consequence, not only in uh, Yemen, but beautiful Syria, and beautiful Libya, and, and beautiful Iraq, and, and, and my goodness, are they going to, I mean, what's happening to our brothers and sisters in Palestine yet again? And let alone what's happening in Central Africa, still no one is paying attention to that catastrophe, let alone what goes on elsewhere in the world. Um, so uh, it's... The Trump administration, it, it's, it's tif difficult to bring a personality like Trump to actually the fore anymore to what's actually happening on the ground in a place like Yemen. Um, hello, and thank you for the very nice presentation. It's a 
bit overwhelming for me to see um, a presentation when I not only have to filter the things said through the cynicism I myself have, but have it presented to me and have it being, well, you know, the, as you said, said, the words being used that you directly go to a conflict with those. Um, and because of that, it's going to be a little bit hard to articulate a meaningful question, but I was initially going to ask you um, whether or not you think, although Yemen is a special case in accordance of in accordance to the magnitude of the humanitarian crisis there, that whether or not it is, well, one could almost say, merely a retelling of everything that's happened in the Middle East for, well, with the movements that's, that happened a century ago. But you almost all already answered that. And, uh, and I was going to ask you then maybe, do you see any changes, although you've, you've clearly sort of given me the impression that you don't, but for example, if you look at uh, internally in Saudi Arabia with Mohammed bin Salman, and you already said it's almost a, a, the movement of desperation because it's a bankrupt com country. And uh, but I would say now, now that you know don't know Denmark, there is becoming a more awareness of this situation. For example, the national uh, television uh, of Denmark sent uh, broadcasted the PBS uh, Frontline. Uh, uh, thing called uh, bitter rivals Iran and Saudi Arabia, and it's going in direct contrast to a lot of the things you said. But um, in there, there was also the implication that, well, it's becoming a, a sort of well, people, the international organizations are having a harder time helping Saudi Arabia do this because there's becoming a, there's coming an awareness in the uh, global population. And so you see things like Mohammed bin Salman giving rights uh, to citizens and, and females in particular, and whether that has any implication of where this is going. Do you see any? Well, I guess it's the end, it's the million dollar question. But is, what about the internal things happening in Saudi Arabia? Do you see anything that might point to a better or worse future? Thank you again. Um, well, I have a little comment uh, and a question. My comment is that the uh, resource issue, uh, I think, is formulated incorrectly. I, the way I see it running is that uh, the elites are basically extorting money from the poor people in the rich countries to destroy the poor people in the poor countries. And, and the, there is not really any resource shortages or anything like this that's driving these developments. I mean, if, uh, you know, over the last 30 years, economic productivity in the West has doubled. So everybody should be working four hours a day instead of eight hours a day now, if the average person could take advantage of that. But we know all of these increases have gone to very small group of people, less than 1% of the population. And, and uh, these people control the media. It is, it, it is to their advantage to lay this out as a zero-sum game, which says, well, you know, if uh, the people there get the goodies and we can't have them, this is just nonsense. Uh, but I'm having, uh, my question is, I'm having trouble seeing what the overall economic structure is that's driving this development. I mean, you, you mentioned all kinds of different things here, but I couldn't quite see what the big picture was, you know. Uh, Okay, so that, that maybe I can answer that by uh, first answering the first question about what's going to happen to Saudi Arabia. And again, the, it's, it's not a million dollar question, it's a hundred billion dollar question, I don't know. Uh, that is a dynamic driving force that has only been exasperated by the 2008 financial crisis, the endless printing of cheap credit for basically corporations to buy their own, to create value out of uh, basically, companies that are not producing anything anymore, uh, that there, there are no, indeed, marketable profits to be, um, especially in regards to competition from the BRICS countries. We're forgetting that there is actual 
uh, demand, increasing and growing demand from countries like India and China, which are not resource rich, at least as far as the fuels that are necessary still to motorize uh, and maintain a motorized economy. Um, and China is indeed the big uh, kind of unspoken player in all this. Um, they have been quite wise in staying out of the conflict in the larger Middle East, although they do occasionally make a statement here and there. Uh, but we are um, uh, missing, I think, also an appreciation for how corrupt global capitalism is. It's actually not uh, operating along market forces. I mean, when you actually fight and find prices and market making is actually a very contrived process and it's very manipulated and it's using media often. And you see Mohammed bin Salman actually doing effectively that, trying to create a buzz to generate and, um, and, and shift in fluid money that goes to um, real estate in San Francisco or New York or to Tokyo or to Dubai and shift it and set, for whatever reason send it into an investment in Saudi Arabia to help this faction of the family. It's just not going to happen. People are too uh, tuned. Um, the intelligence, if you will, is all there if you actually spend the time looking at the numbers. Uh, Saudi Arabia is a bankrupt country. Uh, the families are incredibly rich as individuals, but as we saw, uh, Mohammed bin Salman has actually been um, arresting many of them and stealing their bank account numbers and basically making them a deal they can't refuse. A gangster, uh, like the Americans often do with sovereign states. Yemen is not, as I emphasized from, from the very beginning, is not a poor country. It's a very, very rich country. As I mentioned in my book, I kind of treat Yemen as a kind of entire, over the course of the 20th century, a country increasingly being forced into the global economy. A global economy by, especially the Bretton Woods regime, that was established after 1944, functioning fundamentally to sequester surplus wealth away from savings in national economies to individuals and into a global economy, which ultimately gets funneled into New York and the city of London. Uh, we need to spend more time going back to understanding how finance works in the 19th and 20th century in order for us to understand, ultimately, what will happen to the family of Saudi Arabia. That state, most likely, if it's not going to be able to find a golden bullet and somehow secure the assets that, that Yemen has or from somewhere else, it's over for the family. And it may be very quick because it's in direct conflict with UAE, which is basically on its own race to find some kind of long-term solution. You're not going to have three or four major GCC players surviving this process. Unfortunately, since we are so corrupted in our own values, because we're so comfortable in our own lives here in the West, we are willing to sit aside and let Yemenis, Somalis, people of Congo, and elsewhere in the world die for these kinds of rather nasty little um, kind of structural transformations that are taking place in this world. I'm not leaving China out of this. They're incredibly cynical as well. Chinese political leaders, they're making a big, a big buck on, on people's blood elsewhere as well. There are unfortunately no good guys who are going to benefit from this and who are benefiting from war and, and death and destruction. It's only whom I see as my brothers and sisters who are dying and suffering and who are being plundered. Their homelands are being plundered. And as I argue in the book, there's actually a very interesting story about Yemen's increasing pressure being put on that society to open up its economy, to transform how for a thousand years they've actually functioned in a very vibrant, very wealthy society, self-sufficient in food, that was producing cash crops, they were very much part of the larger Indian Ocean uh, trade networks. And because of the way 19th and 20th century transformed the relationship Yemen had, it became increasingly self-isolating. And the violence brought on to a self-isolating independent society or state that we found in North Yemen and later on in South Yemen is the story of the 20th century, 21st century. So again, I highlight Somalia, which may be a basket case and a sh shithole according to uh, Donald Trump today. Well, it's because it, it's, it, there's a reason behind it. It's an incredibly wealthy society. 
It has the natural resources. Africa is the richest continent by far. And there's no reason why every single African citizen should have their children um, live and survive birth. That there's no reason why there's, there's no drinking water. Why it costs 50 cents to basically provide drinking water to a child. Why are our Africans dying of, of communicable diseases or dying from waterborne diseases? Where's our investment? It's the cheapest solution to all these humanitarian catastrophes. Why aren't we resolving them? I mean, it's an obvious answer. And unfortunately, we, we thrive in, in, the, in the unproductive world. We are no longer producing, I mean, we are, we are very productive. We, we, we basically produce, drawing from the natural resources of the rest of the world, we produce very efficiently what we need. But it's only sustainable if we continuously get the raw materials from the rest of the world cheaply. And we haven't figured out a way to pay a fair price. The world functioned in the past in a much different way. That fair price was paid for services. Fair price was paid for a sovereign who actually had control over resources. We don't do that anymore. We steal. We use some local gangster to help us steal from the masses. And when there is a society that collectively answers and responds to this, we refer to them as rebels, or as Houthis, or as Shia, or as Sunni, as Muslims, as terrorists, or communists in the old days. And that's what motivates me. I'm old enough to remember those days of the last decades of the Cold War. And I see that the conditions haven't changed much. The suffering still continues. So uh, Yemen is targeted because it's rich. And uh, we are the direct or indirect beneficiaries of the continued exploitation and extraction of the natural wealth of places like Yemen or Somalia, et cetera. What do we do about it? I don't know. We're not going to take up Kalashnikovs, that's for sure. I think that was our last question for tonight. Oh. Okay. A quick, one. quick one. And uh, our sister over there as well. Yes. Uh, just let that. Uh, first, thank you to uh, the Serpent Times for covering this topic. I think that's uh, yeah important. And thanks for your presentations. I appreciate it, especially the historical links. Um, I think my question is. Actually, if you could just pinpoint, you already mentioned it, I think, uh, implicitly, why are we not hearing about this in the media, in the mainstream media? And is it just as simple as, I mean, Western actors, the US, the Brits are complicit in the war crimes, that we're not listening about it, hearing about it, getting pictures? Is it obviously also the fact that it's difficult for journalists to get access and to get in? But if you could just pinpoint why we're not hearing about it. And one, one last question. Raise your hand. Yeah. Um, there was actually um, almost the same question. Um, I wondered about the media coverage or the lack of in, like, just in the West and maybe just around the world. Um, and you also mentioned just briefly how there's been being spent a lot of money on for us not to know about the humanitarian crisis in Yemen. Um, can you elaborate more on how and where you see it? Uh, so quickly, uh, especially in, uh, in West Europe and the United States, uh, the consolidation of uh, the means of delivery information um, obviously is consolidated by uh, increasingly smaller um, pool of uh, actors, uh, the corporatization, if you will, of the media. And uh, at the same time, the, the, dis the explosion of independent providers of information, which is often just circulating things that they're finding by surfing the web, um, has this wonderful, ingenious kind of conv um, convoluting um, effect. 
um, where the demand for actual um, news, uh, where you have investigative reporting, is actually not there, or at least to justify investing in uh, the kind of reporters on the ground who can actually provide detailed, rich uh, narratives about what's going on. So there is actual um, a structural economic accounting for why uh, media has transformed over the last 30 or 40 years, let alone the heavy investment in propaganda and the use of these resources to tell one story and not the other, to as much silence or obscure events as I was suggesting as other. But frankly, there are journalists on the ground. There are Yemeni journalists, and they're producing lots and lots of content from photographs to video to narratives and AFP, Reuters, others, they're getting all the material they could possibly want to use, all the tragic images and all the narratives about human beings who are suffering. And yet, it's at the editorial level. It's at the corporate level. And I know this for a fact from my own experiences in dealing with the New York Times, for instance, and my own experiences in dealing being a founder of a news agency and a newspaper in the late 1990s in the Balkans, that you can produce the content all you want, um, but ultimately the shape and form it ultimately in the end takes, if it's going to end up in a place like the New York Times, is often incredibly different from what you initially handed over as finished product, for one. So there's a lot of intermediary factors. There are individuals who have political kind of um, connections. Um, obviously, uh, the, the choice to, to actually tell this story um, is conveniently un unnecessary when the audience itself doesn't demand these stories. Um, again, the question of the market. They, we will always be told that if there's a demand and then there will be a service provided. I don't necessarily believe that. I don't necessarily believe that's the force that actually animates our interest. I think we require, first and foremost, a kind of active advocacy, if you will, um, largely through these medium forms to mobilize us to actually make demands for this. But it could help if there is an onslaught of asking why aren't you providing more content from those very brave journalists in North Yemen, in Somalia, in Democratic Republic of Congo, who are reporting, reporting daily these tragedies. Um, Again, there's plenty of that material. Unfortunately, it's in fake news kind of outlets, but there's plenty of these horrible, horrible pictures. I don't show you even a, a small percentage of the, of the intensity of the, of the violence that people are experiencing. You can unfortunately find it everywhere on the web. Uh, you have another question? Okay. Yeah, so I'll just allow the last question, but quick question, quick answer. Okay. So we don't uh, exceed our time limit. Uh, time limit. Okay, um, isn't there like some kind of paradox between the UAE support of um, the southern separatists and then being part of the GCC and how does that work in, in real life and the clash with the Saudis when in the south and then the kind of alliance in the GCC. That's if you believe in the GCC's function as a, and a reflection of sincere unity. I mean, it's, it's a rather a recent, historically recent phenomenon and it's all, it always had demonstrated tensions internally they just choose not to um, share their dirty laundry with the rest of the world. But I assure you, there's lots of nastiness that goes on behind closed doors. Uh, UAE in particular has long um, reviled uh, its neighbors for its use of uh, political Islam um, as an, uh, um, a blunt weapon or tool to uh, influence events in neighboring countries. And the UAE in particular is terrified of this spilling over into its own uh, political sphere, if you will, and has been very aggressive in persecuting, especially um, known members of the, the Brotherhood, which Qatar has invested heavily in uh, over the, the years, and Saudi Arabia to a lesser extent, but they have their own kind of 
assets, if you will. So the UAE also has territorial disputes with Saudi Arabia, as I mentioned before. And again, th this war itself, the way it plays itself out, um, if we continue to see the GCC as some kind of functioning reflection of a unified uh, set of sovereign states or rulers, uh, then we're missing, I think, a very important component to uh, politics in a larger sense. I mean, it's like a democratic party or a part of the central party in this, what's the big party here in Denmark? I don't know. Obviously, internally, there's all kinds of factors going on that are causing for tensions that most of the time never make it to our, uh, make it available for our uh, consumption. Um, as its position itself, um, it has long invested in building infrastructure. It has invested in mines. It had leases for the big ports, Aden, Mukalla, and elsewhere. It, it, it basically had hoped, and it still hopes, to secure through family alliances um, uh, a kind of a, a, re, a, um, a recreation, if you will, of the old British system of these sultanates, and maybe an extension that they even at some point, if you look at some maps, conceptualizations of linking Abu Dhabi territorially with Yemen, cutting right across that area that today is separated by Saudi Arabia. And again, I'm, I insist this, this is uh, something that's within the imagination because, again, many of the people who fled South Yemen after 1967 when uh, the British left, they went to what would remain of the British areas of influence, the trucial states that became the UAE after independence. And they married into the ruling families of Ashman, of Ras al Khaimah, and more importantly, Abu Dhabi. So uh, the leaders of the UAE are Yemeni through, through the mothers. And this is their kind of their heavy investment. This is their homeland in many ways. We can't forget these kinds of dynamics, right? I'm pretty sure that um, that's instilled in some of these young men's when they hear from their mother the stories of the homeland. Um, last thing, if you want to uh uh, get to know more about uh, Ethan Blumi's theories and perspectives, you can read his book. I read it and he elaborates on a lot of these things we've uh, talked about tonight. It's called Destroying Him. Um, where can you get it? I got it for free. <laughs> Steal it from some Russian website. <laughs> no, I got it from you actually. It's also an academic book. Okay, it's in the academic books. So, um, yeah, I think that's the last thing. Just a quick, quick request. Um, the Jordan Times is still a very small media project, and we're competing with the big guys. Um, so please do uh, follow us on Facebook and uh, Instagram. Uh, check out our website and support us so we can do more events such as this one. You've seen our social media links a thousand times by now. So thanks again.